Thank you all very much for joining. It's an exciting day. It's uh, uh, a little bit clearer than I think the day we went to launch a year ago, uh, but I'm really happy to, to, um, to share this, this special anniversary for Blue Shift and, and importantly have uh, many guest stars on well, with us today to reflect about that time. It was, um, well, I was pulling out of Tim McCabe's hotel uh, and in my truck, my old beaten up truck, and it was minus 14 degrees Fahrenheit. I think it was uh, uh, warmed up pretty quickly to minus 12 with shortly. So, uh, and it was barely good conditions that time, barely condi good conditions in terms of, it was a little bit cloudy. Um, and just two weeks ago, we had to cancel our flight because of too many clouds in the sky. And we had to have at least 50% clear, clearer skies to launch. So it was such an exciting experience. You know, we, I think we couldn't have created a better drama, although I think it was really taxing all of us. We had, um, we had in our second try, uh, two weeks later, we had over a hundred cars pull up, including uh, actually, and the media was on top of that, who was parked next to us. So parked, what, halfway down the runway was the general public. And then we were about a third of the way up the runway from the launch site uh, at the southern end of the, uh, northern end of the runway. And uh, um, bitterly cold, and I was I was amazed. We had cars there from New York, New Jersey. This is the, this is when COVID was was a new thing. <laughs> it wasn't the normal, right? And people were coming from far, far away uh, to to watch us. This you know way up to northern reaches of Maine, uh, where Tim Tim lives. So um, I, you know, for me, I, I know some of these folks on here. You guys have probably seen actual rocket launches. This was my very first one. Um, now. I, I'm going to steal a little bit of thunder from Luke because Luke said it best, and I can't actually repeat it. But on the moment of launch, I think we all felt the same way that Luke expressed it on video on YouTube. Um, <laughs> he's turning red. Um, the shot heard around the world. <laughs> yeah. But it was it was amazing. It was an amazing sight, and just to hear hear the rocket take off, and after so many attempts, it was like we had we had three tries. We had three tries that morning. Um, and we were, we were supposed to launch in the morning. Uh, we had to scrub it due to um, due to challenges. Oh, the main the main flow valve, the main oxidizer valve didn't go on. Actually, I'm just going to switch over to Luke for a second. Luke, can you can you just for a minute just say what happened there? Just the very early moments when we tried to our initial attempt at launch that morning. Yeah, you mean when the the main valve didn't open that particular yeah attempt? yeah. Yeah, that was, um, everything seemed to be going well. And um, the igniter goes on, which uh, sort of obviously starts the ignition and um, gets things kind of warmed up. Um, but then when the main valve doesn't go on, uh, that kept going. And then you just sort of get kind of just lazy flames out of the bottom of the rocket. Um, so we had to shut that off really quickly before it damaged the vehicle. And we have like liquid CO2 that we're able to pump into the combustion chamber to cool things back off. And um, so we had to do that real quick. Um, so Brooke, uh, who was at the controls, had to do some quick thinking and um, figured out the main valve wasn't doing what it was supposed to. And uh, yeah, we were very happy that our fire extinguishing systems worked. worked. <laughs> Yeah, so it's a slightly charcoal bottom half, bottom section, not bottom half, but bottom bottom end of of, of Stardust. Um, and Pedro, you were you were helping uh, along with a couple other folks. I think Ashish was there, uh, Dr. Ashish from the University of Southern Maine, and other folks, um, Michael Osterameki. Um, but Pedro, you were there. You were helping set up barriers so people wouldn't accidentally run over with a, a snowmobile. Maybe you could talk a little bit about what happened that morning for you. Hi, Sasha. Good, good to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Uh, you know, it was uh, it was really remarkable to see the community's response. And as you said, we had folks there from all over uh, the the states. Um, you know, we had more than a hundred cars, and it was interesting that uh, when we had to recycle. Um, as you just uh, mentioned, folks would leave and go get food and do some things around town, and then they would come right back. Uh, and so I thought that that was uh, very interesting given the times. As you said, uh, COVID was brand new to us, and uh, there were a lot of folks uh, 
you know, who just really didn't understand what the virus was about or how it could harm us. And so uh, it, was a, it was a remarkable experience. One of my favorite um, memories of it is the night before I, I drove out to, to the launch structure and Brooke was out there. And um, as I'm driving down the runway, I look over to my right and I see this beautiful moonrise that just just came up and just lit, excuse me, lit up the entire uh, runway. It was just really gorgeous and, and a tremendous moment. So it was really uh, meaningful to me. Yeah, pa by the way, Pedro, I'm, I'm forgetting to introduce your people. Uh, I'm gonna quickly do this because Luke is our senior mechanical engineer. He's been with us since nearly the beginning um, and uh, has been you know, the core of the design for Stardust and the rockets uh, we're going ahead with. Um, Pedro Vasquez is our, our blue ship brand ambassador. ambassador. Tim McCabe uh, is of Loring Industries and also owner of the, the hotel where we stayed many a times. Um, and uh, we, we lucked out because the snow was really crappy and there weren't, it was, the hotel wasn't completely packed with people snowmobiling uh, at that time of the year, which was a good thing, bad thing for you. Uh, Tim, I, I'm gonna let you kind of talk about it. I know, but what you guys for you. kind of filled that void at least for, uh, let's say a month. Uh, That's true. So and what a crew, your, your crew, everyone was just so nice. Um, you know, sometimes in the hotel business, you run into people that are cranky and all of that. You guys were, couldn't be further from the truth. So um, you're right, being up on the runway, it was cold and it was the first time one of my brothers came to visit me. So we were up there trying to help volunteer and you know, give us jobs, whatever you want us to do. Yep. And I came up with a proposal and I think Seth can verify this that I started working out my thumbs to throw the switch in case your man with the switch, you know, panicked or passed out or whatever, I would be the backup. And I was ready. I worked out for days and days. And actually <laughs> to this day, my wife wants to, me to open a can of beans. I just use my thumb. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. So it was really, it was a wonderful experience. My brother and I still talk about it. And, uh, your crew were nothing but the best. Uh, so so professional. And um, when I did ask that question, I only asked it twice. Is this really rocket science? And the answer was, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah, it, is. it was, yeah. And Pedro, I don't know if you remember this, but me and my brother and Sandy went back to the hotel. We were freezing. And so we came back and you were like this, you know, waving us on. And I said, they going? He said, they going, they going. <laughs> oh, it was so exciting. It was so exciting. Yeah, just just yeah. a reminder. You listed at the former uh, Loring Air Force Base, uh, Northern Limestone, Maine, um, decommissioned, and you know this incredible place. Like it's just uh, you know from the Cold War era, so many big air, you know aerospace buildings just sort of ready for business. Uh, and we were so fortunate that we were able to, to make full utilization of this location, Tim being one of the fixtures of, of the Loring uh, Commerce location. So I'm uh, sorry, Pedro, I cut you off. I apologize. No worries, Sasha. I just wanted to express my gratitude uh, to Tim and, and his crew uh, for uh, their hospitality. It was just phenomenal. I mean, I, I came in, you know, in the middle of the night, really, I think it was like 3 a.m. They had a bottle of water set out for me. They had a nice little note set out for me. And, uh, and then they delivered, uh, if, I'm, if my memory serves me, uh, hot coffee. And uh, there were some pastries that were delivered to us uh, as we were preparing to do our thing. So uh, it's great to see you, Tim. And thank you for everything. You're welcome. And don't forget, I baked the pastries, okay? Just, I'm just saying. <laughs> no, I didn't. No, I didn't. So months prior to this, so we, you know, we, we wrapped up um, in February, we wrapped up a grant um, from NASA to uh, February of 20, that would have to be, geez, I'm going to get my years all screwed up here. 2020, right? Luke, help me out here. Make sure I got this right. It was 2020 when we, fi we finished the NASA grant. Yeah, Wasn't it 2019? In. I think it was 2019. I thought it was 2018 was when we... 2019 is when we got it. When we started it, yeah. And 2020 is when we wrapped it up. Yeah, it could have been February or something like that, right? Yeah. And, uh, you know, we'd, we'd honed in the engine. It was ready for flight. We, was, we heard from potential investors show us you can fly something, show this can be done, get a few customers, one of them which we have on board right now, Andrew with us, Andrew Nya from uh, Falmouth High School, um, and um, launch it, even though it's a mile up, recover the payload, give it back to the customers and show you can do it. Show, you know, there's so many rocket companies developing engines, but almost nobody has actually launched anything. 
So that's what we did. And, and you know, the plans, of course, were to do that launch in October uh, and then November and then December <laughs> and then January and then middle of January. And then, you know, the very last we had to scrub it due to weather and the very last day uh, of January. But back, I think, Andrew, now we first talked to you guys, what, maybe in June or July of 2020? It was, was, um, it? It was actually early October. Oh, it was that fast? So you guys scrambled really quickly. It was it was quick. It was actually kind of a confluence, um, uh, like a, a just sort of a lucky confluence of of um, opportunities. To be honest, um, we have a another space grant is um, for a CubeSat that will fly. That's being built mostly by uh, the universe UMO up in up in Maine, uh, Orono. Orono in partnership with USM. And then as part of that, they were, uh, we were one of three schools that are gonna fly on that. Um, and then USM started doing a, work, a series of workshops and we had just started with that. Um, but we had been working hard for pretty much a year, the whole um, remotely, pretty much uh, through COVID, uh, once we found out we were flying, working with the UMO people. And I think you had reached out to um, the people up at UMO and uh, Joseph Patton, who is the mission coordinator for, uh, for the team, uh, just reached out to us and said, there's an opportunity to fly if you can take it. <laughs> you guys jump. We're like, gee, fast. I don't know. <laughs> I didn't think about that one. Um, and ac actually, we did. We, had, we ran it by the team. And they were like, yeah, we, yeah, we think we can do this. Two weeks, no problem. What are we going to do? <laughs> <laughs> So we and had you to did, you did these. Did. <laughs> exactly. We had to come up with something. And uh, we had just gotten exposed to the X in a box chips. Which is now Max IQ. IQ. Yeah. With the Mac, yeah, now they're Max IQ. Yeah. So we thought, well, we could probably put something together. Um, and so we did. And I'm really glad you didn't fly until January because I don't it worked think, out. Or, yeah, it, it worked <laughs> out much better because. It's, it, it's challenging to take a new technology and figure out how to do it. And our whole philosophy is um, the students do it. And we had a team of four kids uh, and, and they, you know, anywhere from 10th grade to 12th grade yep. at the time, sort of working and having to figure out the max IQ, having to figure out what's gonna happen, how to, how to shake it, how do you fit it together? Um, and so yeah. they, what, what they got, um, there, there are four college essays, four college application essays that um, came out of this. It was an amazing chance for them to be scientists Yeah. Um, that does not come along often. Yeah. So um, the, the, whole, the whole thing was just sort of wild. Yeah, and that was, so that was, you know, just to remind folks, that this is the precursor of what became later a launch, our first launch contract with Max IQ yeah. uh, to launch student, you know, this wasn't our original um, target customer base, but we're really happy to have them on board. And so they're allowing people to, kids to across the world, not just, you know, not by just Maine, but this is a Blue Shift branded version, um, but across the world to do space science and launch with us. Uh, on an ongoing basis. And so, so you know, right now, I think there's over 30 schools signed up from across the world right now uh, to launch with us this year. And uh, they will be launching up to 60 a year. Uh, and hopefully Falmouth High School once again. Uh, but uh, we're also working at Jonesport High School. But there's uh, folks from all over the world uh, and all over the United States that are going to be launching from us doing science projects. It's really, really cool. And what's been amazing about the Falmouth High School is you, it was just the go get itness and the, and the kids just jumping into it, getting their hands dirty. And this is the whole uncomfortable time of, you know, COVID. It was just really amazing to see how much, you know, what they pulled off. All right, guys, I'm going to do my thing and, and, and jump in real quick. Uh, yeah. Just keep things moving. But real, real quick, we just go around and say, like, at, at that moment of liftoff. You haven't heard the engine yet, but you see that it's working. What is that moment like? Luke, don't answer this one, actually. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I'll, I'll, we'll start with uh, we'll start with Pedro. 
Thanks, guys. Uh, it was really a fulfilling moment. You know, uh, I am part of the generation that saw the entire space shuttle program. I was a 10 year old kid sitting across from the Banana River watching that thing jump off the planet. And, um, you know, I, I can tell you that I was never the same again. Uh, the space bug bit me and it stuck. And to see this achievement in Maine in the middle of the winter uh, by um, such a talented and dedicated team, uh, you know, I was I had goosebumps from head to toe, maybe from the cold, but also because of what I what it meant to me or what I was witnessing. And so, thank you for uh, for sharing that with me. Um, Andrew, maybe you could describe you, you guys. You guys, you were dialed in virtually, I think, by video, and you probably experienced it like many people did. Um, yeah, we, yeah, we were all just watching. It was actually um, sort of this double layer. We were all sort of watching it on YouTube, and then we had a Zoom meeting with you know with with everybody there. So we were all there, sort of in real YouTube Zoom time, and seeing the video where you'd sort of see it but not hear it, and then reception would would disappear, and we go, we think it's going. People are cheering. Um, <laughs> audio was coming through but the video was not yeah. right and yeah. um but and and then we had gone through the three previous launches so all day we had sort of been sitting there and then going okay well we'll get back in another hour or so um so e in each time you know the 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 excitement kind of builds and you go this time this time and so when it finally actually went it was really just like you feel this really rush you're connected um and there was this like is it really going? Is that it? It's like, oh wow, we did it. <laughs> you know, it's there. And then and then when it came down and everything was all intact, it's like, wow, the whole thing worked. It, it, this is like um, you know, and, and, and they're in there. They they have tried to get the, you know, every piece to work and they know how hard it is to make um, something technical work the way it's supposed to. So when you actually see it do that you know, in, in below zero weather and with all the challenges, you know, they got that. Yeah. Um, and so it's just like, it's, it's a rush. You don't get to experience very often. I think it was just a few weeks before um, the Russians had poked fun at um, SpaceX and Boca Chica and others that they can't launch in cold, cold conditions. And then we go ahead and launch. Well, actually, yeah, we can. We still can in the United States. We still got it. <laughs> Doesn't have to be really warm. Tim, maybe you could talk about when the moment it, it launched, what it was like for you? Well, I'll tell you, you know, hanging out with you and your crew for a couple of weeks, we all, everyone was waiting. Everyone was anticipating, you know, you could see everyone's excitement and nervousness, maybe. Yeah. We were nervous for you. And then <laughs> the first couple of times when it didn't go, it was like, everyone was like, oh my God, I'm so sorry for these guys. I mean, you know, they've worked so hard to do this. And you're in the middle of January. And then when it finally went, Pedro, the people screaming and yelling and hooting and hollering that it was up and it was it was perfect. It was just such a wonderful feeling uh, for everyone, uh, for everyone. It was really, really, I want you back. I know you can't, but I want you back. Thinking about that. We'll keep thinking about that. <laughs> Luke, you, you've... Uh... You, your feelings run deep and there's not, outside of one particular audio event, maybe you could talk about what it was like for you, you know, the accumulation of all the hard work and, and the, the tries and then finally getting to lift off. Sure, yeah. Um, well, uh, it's, it's definitely a visceral feeling. Um, when things don't work, you literally feel sick. And uh, when they do work, you, you're like, uh, get a, a serious rush um and uh i guess for me you're testing all these systems on the ground one by one and you test them together as best you can you do a, like a hot fire of the whole vehicle strap down to the pad um and uh but you really can't test everything in a truly representative environment you kind of um it's got to work <laughs> the first time um, for the first flight anyway. Um, so seeing um, the systems all perform together was uh, insanely gratifying. I had a list of 
you know, a handful of things that couldn't really test properly. And I sort of, I had them in my mind. I'm like, okay, uh, you know, and as it was working and it was a beautiful flight, it was better than uh, we could have ever hoped for, you know, as it's going, the list of things that could be going wrong that we haven't been able to properly test was getting shorter. You know, we were, okay, okay, scratch, scratch the quick disconnect arms off the list that worked. Okay. You know, ignition. Worked. The rail. Um, yeah. It, the rail worked properly. It was able to, you know, we couldn't really run it along the rail at the same velocity. It was really going to leave, uh, you know, the, the, um, the tip off, off the rail was good. Uh, we didn't get a gust of wind at the wrong time. Um, then it was the parachutes. Okay. The parachutes worked great. Um, so it was just this list of failure modes was just getting shorter as it went on. And it just goes from, you sort of, your mood goes from like extreme anxiety to like joy over Relation. the course of like 10 <laughs> seconds. You know, you're, you're happy because it's, it lifted off, it ignited, but you're still really nervous because you know, there's a lot of other things that could have come on. So <laughs> by the time, by the time the main parachute is out and it's just floating down, like, I'm I'm checked out at that point. <laughs> so, Very cool. I had just one little thing, and that yeah. was uh, the rocket went up, the chutes came out, and it was coming straight down. I mean, almost you could say it's going to land right on the apparatus. But yeah, we had those folks with the snowmobiles there. Yes, right? we did. What was the name up. of the family? The name of the family again? Uh, um, I'll think of it. Okay, you should think of it. Bouchard. Yeah, yeah. yeah, Bouchard. Bouchard. Okay. Bouchard family, yeah. And they were ready to go. And then, I don't know, one of you guys came out, okay, recovery team! And <laughs> it was great. It was recovery great. by snowmobile, it was awesome. Yeah, for me, it was it was an incredible experience. You know, I was, that was the first time I'd ever seen any rocket launch beyond the Estes, right? And my own, you know, crazy designs when I was a kid. So for me, just hearing that sound and seeing it actually go up the way you imagine it does was, it was amazing. I remember just prior to launch, Luke, you and Brooke basically were begging me because I had the I had a I had the flight termination system in my hand. Um, you guys were like, Sasha, don't kill it, <laughs> don't kill it prematurely, don't stop it, because I was like, I had to be ready there. That was the I was sort of the last stop between um, between you know if it was going sideways, something's going to happen. We need to manually shut that sucker down. Um, and uh, man, was I nervous! Uh, I was super nervous. Um, and, and when it took off and the sound, the glorious sound of just like that, just, I, I don't know how to explain it. Visceral was the right word. Visceral definitely was the right word. Um, and, you know, we had so many things, so many challenges. I mean, the, the cold itself meant we, our battery shut down. Now we, we tested this out, but the batteries are shut down in the, the rocket. We'd figured out actually how to preheat the batteries to prepare them, so that was good. But then the laptops were, were shutting down. So we'd done things like strapping heating pads to the back, you know, those uh, iron filling, what are those called, those thermal whatever pads to the bottom of laptops. But that still didn't work. So Brooke, Brooke, who was managing the launch, had to take his computer, which was where we were managing all the, the launch from, and put it into his Prius. So I'm, I'm pretty sure it's one of the first Prius controlled launch sites, mission controls. Just, you know, it's not an advertisement for Toyota, just, uh, but. Um, but yeah, then we pegged it. We, we landed, we couldn't have landed more perfectly uh, and parachuted it down. It was right spot on. Uh, so it was just an incredible experience. And I think what everybody has to remember is that this whole thing is within the context of we're one, doing it in Maine. So people say, nah, I don't, you're not going to be able to do it in Maine. But two, and probably this is the, really the one, is like we're doing use a bio-derived, carbon-neutral, non-toxic rocket fuel. And everybody's like, man, no, no, no. And so that was what we were fighting. And, and from my, like my experience in, in my renewable energy company, Alt E, the solar days, I remember in early, the late 90s, people thought solar doesn't work. There was just this sort of mythology around oh, solar doesn't work. And now I think, and we clearly that's not an issue now, same thing is happening with rocket fuel. We're finally getting to the point where people, um, uh, where folks understand that doing things in a non-toxic, more earth-friendly way, even when you're traveling to space, is feasible and uh, and hopefully profitable. So uh, I'm just going to add a little twist onto this. So um, you know, we parked, we'd parked the 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 rocket in. Um, it was a hot shot. Is it a hot shot hangar? Is that what that's called? With the F 
15s were parked. Yeah, uh, right, right. correct. Yeah. yeah, so that's where we, you know, we became the, the rocket garage. Uh, we, we parked the rocket Stardust along with um, the launch rail system all parked right inside that giant hangar. So it's probably the last thing that I'd seen is probably some F-15s. Um, but the, the night when I finally started heading home, um, I had to get home because there was a, a, yet another snowstorm coming. And I would think it was somewhere around Millinocket, heading south towards Brunswick. And it was just beginning to snow. And I had in the back of the truck, the launch, the launch system, the launch trailer. And I had my phone propped up uh, on the dashboard and was driving along. And all of a sudden I see pop up there, uh, Angus King was calling. I'm like, oh, this is a prank call. And I was like, no, this is not really Angus King. <laughs> so I picked it up and I, I was I just sure this was going to be a prank call. And um, in the most nicest voice and just, you know, like he was my next door neighbor. Angus King was indeed on the other side. This is the Senator of Maine, uh, independent Senator from Maine, Angus King. Um, and he was, uh, you know, it was a proud moment for the state of Maine because, you know, it says made in Maine on the bottom of the rocket. Was it this way, right? Um, and uh, it was seen, it was, it was, it was on uh, the BBC. We were covered by AP News, space.com. Uh, uh, help me out, Seth, here. It was also, we had folks restreaming our videos uh, in Latin America, in, in French, and in Polish. Um, uh, Daniel Reguera was, was uh, publishing it down in Latin America from Uruguay. And, you know, it was really kind of putting Maine on the map of aerospace. The Maine is open and ready to, for the aerospace, the new space industry. Um, and, and so, he, you know, it was really cool to have him thank what we did and all the hard efforts to be recognized in that moment in time and not get into a car accident while I was driving down <laughs> slick roads <laughs> with a rocket trail, trailer raised many tons in the back. So that was, it was very cool. Um, so, you know, this has been an incredible experience. We, we made history. We, be, we were the first company in the world that, we're, that we know of that commercially launched a rocket. We had two customer payload, two paying customer payloads, in addition to the one, the academic one from Andrew's high school team. Uh, on board. We were the first ones to launch using a bio-derived uh, non-toxic fuel. And this year, we plan on being the very first company to do the same thing, but launching commercially all the way to space, uh, somewhere here in Maine, and certainly the United States, all the way to space, demonstrating once again, that a more earth responsible fuel and, um, and a non-toxic one can be used with rockets going forward. So we're very, very excited. And the guys are working so hard at doing this. Um, and I think right now the, it's being plowed, our test stand's being plowed. So stay tuned for that. Um, I did just wanna do uh, some, some sort of just give a quick update of some of the, the major milestones the team, the team has uh, now uh, pushed through. First of all, um, the the the, the team has already constructed the full um, the full test stand is all constructed the concrete test stand uh, there's a um, we've done cold flow tests of the uh, injection systems for the our, our full size uh, Stardust engine the Marvel uh, they've loaded the, the the giant fuel grain this we've gone from the fuel grain that's our fuel core you know the the non Toxic fuel. Instead of weighing like 14 pounds, it weighs what, Luke? Uh, about 600 and something pounds? 600 yeah, and... six, six to 800 pounds, sort of depending on the exact configuration. Yeah, so that's like a whole new level. You can't just lift this up with your hands like we could before. And you, 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 the logistics is a science unto itself and an engineering effort to, to boot. Um, Richard Clark from MTI has been helping us out with. Um, uh, helping us with the, the financial modeling or, or associated with our business going forward, not only for the suborbital flights, but for the orbital ones. And uh, the team is getting very, very close to, um, uh, well, the team has almost finished up all the cabling for uh, all the enclosures that are involved for our test site. This is for the contr controlling the valves, collecting the data, et cetera. So um, we're, we're expecting here within just a few weeks to finally have that much awaited first um, full-size Marvel engine test. And uh, again, I think this might be the, this will probably be the largest uh, uh, biofuel powered rocket engine test by a commercial company, uh, I believe, at least uh, certainly with hybrid rockets. I've yet to verify that one. 
Anyways, meanwhile, we are racing to hit $1 million raised on our WeFunder campaign, our WeFunder crowd equity funding campaign. We're getting very close, right? About 830 or $840,000 there. Once we reach to the $1 million mark, um, what, uh, MTI, this is Maine Technology Institute, actually matches us um, with 100, not matches us, but it will give us $100,000 in non dilutive funding, which is really attractive as a potential investor. Uh, other investors on, on uh, refunder and uh, to help us push us along. So this, um, once we get beyond the 1 million mark or the 1 million mark, we'll be, we'll be focusing all those additional fundraising efforts to fully develop the two starless rogue suborbital rockets and uh, begin the whole environmentally of our environmental permitting process that's required for the launch site that we need to finalize. And, um, and if all goes well, by the end of the year, we'll be launching starless rogue all the way up to space making history again. But um, as a way to, as a sort of a funny, uh, this is really, this is a slightly embarrassing, but also really cool and funny at the same time. As a way to generate excitement, some of you might've seen this uh, post on social media. Uh, we've decided to raffle off five awesome, you can see here in the background, five awesome um, movie posters. Uh, and uh, so there's only a very, very, very small handful that probably about five, maybe six. Uh, one we'll have here in the in the at the office. Um, we'll be raffling these off. So we'll be driving. We'll be, we will draw five winners um, for these movie po movie posters once we hit our one million goal. So we just ask that you uh, please help spread the word. Uh, you know, one of the hardest aspects of funding a startup is that we're up against you know the giants who have millions of dollars and billions of dollars to spend on the marketing and uh, development of uh, traditional rockets and we are a grassroots organization and we, we rely upon folks like you many of our investors who are here today on um, on this webinar to help spread the word get the word out there about what we're doing so um later i think in about a half an hour we're going to actually do the premiere the fun premiere of the starless rogue blue shift uh, video at the top of the hour so it's a little bit of fun on our behalf but I did want to, um, I'm going to pass it over to you for a minute, Seth, because I want to see if you could share some of the videos and photos from that we're all referencing of what happened uh, the day of launch. Absolutely, Sasha. Just one moment as I share my screen. And if we have time afterwards, um, I love, you know, folks have questions and stuff. If we have time, I also want to open it up just in case folks want to ask any questions. Or if uh, any of the folks from the panel uh, want, to, want to have any other thoughts and stuff they want to share with folks um, who are in this webinar, please feel free. All right. All right. So uh, this is an oldie but a goodie. This is the Stardust mission profile, uh, which Sasha, you and I worked together to, to kind of animate here. Uh, but basically, it was a seven seconds of a full powered burn. And then it actually um, it, it kind of pseudo coasted a little while, kind of like pulling off the gas in an automatic transmission, right? There's this kind of low powered thrust mode where you're burning through any excess fuel. Um, and then about four seconds of time in what we would not really call true microgravity. It's kind of free fall, but there's still air resistance. And then this is this is the part where I'm pretty certain that Luke started chanting, shoot, shoot, shoot. And then Michael chimed in, shoot, shoot, shoot. And before you knew it, like there was a ton of people in the crowd. And you can hear this on, on Cuppy Jondro's live stream of this whole event. You can hear a whole bunch of people just shouting, shoot, shoot. And that's, and then the rocket separates. I mean, please deploy the shoot. Please shoot, deploy. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Did not become alarmed there. Yeah. Yep. And uh, yes, yeah, so that was, that was a moment of catharsis for like a hundred people. Uh, that was amazing to be a part of. So then we get into the descent configuration here. We got a drogue shoot, making sure everything is properly oriented. And uh, then now this, this was particularly brilliant. Sasha, how, how did the team arrive at this, this element of the design where the engine section uh, touches down first? So now that same parachute, that same cross section of air resistance, now it only has to slow down maybe a third of the weight of the rocket for that last bit of descent, right? That's how, how did uh, how'd you get to that? 
Well, I mean, that was that was Luke and team and Brooke who kind of came up with that concept. Um, uh, I should let I should let Luke talk about it. Uh, it worked out really well because it means our payload section came down much very at a very gentle uh, descent. Yeah, I um, I can't take full credit for that idea. It's um, our parachute manufacturer um, who has a ton of experience making parachutes for um, for sounding rockets, scientific sounding rockets, and for large drones um, for you know all sorts of uses. Um, helped come up with that concept where uh, you have the heavy bit of the vehicle hanging lower. And then as soon as it touches down, your fragile payload um, slows down much more. And then you don't need to oversize the chute so that it can take the full weight of the entire vehicle. So um, the, the Marvel portion, which is the bit with the fins, that's just the engine, which is um, quite rugged and uh, could handle a, a higher touchdown velocity. Um, and we, we had a, an aluminum crash zone, crunch, you know, crush zone on the bottom of the vehicle so that um, when it hit the ground, there was a sacrificial foot or so of, of aluminum structure that was designed to crumple and absorb, shock absorb. Um, and that was In fact, effective. Sasha, is it on the table behind you, Sasha? Uh, it has been in the past. I don't see it now. Oh man. Okay. Never mind. Sorry. <laughs> Luke, you're saying, sorry. Oh, it just, uh, it seemed to work great. It, um, it touched down fins first and, uh, all the fingers and, uh, bits of that aluminum are all splayed out and it, you know, it looked like, Oh my God, you did a bunch of damage, but that was what we designed it to do and absorbed a bunch of the shock. And, um, then, uh, the, the payload area, the nose cone just settled right down next to it. And, uh, it was great because the parachute landed, and it just sort of folded itself out across the snow. It looked like you'd arranged it, you know, ready to fold it back up. It was, it was a more um, picture perfect flight or landing than um, you normally expect. It's it's normally a matter of picking it out of a tree somewhere, but um, it was we had a nice large open area, so it was all good. Um, and we'd done a lot of analysis over what are the probabilities of it landing in different areas based on what the wind was doing. So that was a big, um, call it Monte Carlo analysis and dispersion. And um, so we sort of had an idea of all the different areas it could land and what probability it would land in those different areas. So that was gratifying to see it land where we thought it was most likely to land. Um, so. It was beautiful. It was beautiful and convenient. It was right next to the runway. I couldn't ask for better. Well, thanks, Luke. Yeah. All right. Move spotlight. There we go. Okay. So um, a lot of the work that went into Stardust came in, in the form of, of uh, plumbing and wiring. Um, and this is, this is uh, Brooke, our lead test engineer uh, at the time, working on the guts of Stardust. Uh, the, goal, the goal here was to take the test stand motor and basically put it into a more compact uh, form factor. And so you can see steel components here that you probably wouldn't normally see on a rocket of, of, of this class, uh, but it was incredibly effective. Now, uh, Sasha, this is the walk-in composites oven and then the layup facility over at Tech Place, right? Yes, yeah. Uh, we were very fortunate that here at Tech Place at Brunswick Landing, um, they actually early on when they, when they um, before they bought this uh, composite oven, they asked us, How, what dimension do you need for your future rockets? Uh, and this, you know, this is an expense that most rocket companies have to, if they're gonna do composites and we are, you have to take on yourself. And so we're very fortunate. We're, we have this island in Maine in Brunswick that is so welcoming to aerospace and manufacturing um, that they, you know, they have a quite extensive facilities in addition to the machining and uh, they have this whole composite layup facility. So we're so fortunate to be here in Maine, so fortunate to be in Brunswick Landing, the, the um, MRA's um, campus 
um, and have access to these facilities at such a reasonable cost and not have to spend hundreds, if not millions of dollars to do all this. Yeah, I, I remember speaking to you one or two days right after the, the Stardust launch, and you mentioned that this layup facility from Tech Place cut, cut the lifetime operating costs of, the, of Blue Shift Aerospace roughly in half from, from incorporation to Stardust flight. Yeah, it's, it's, it's amazing savings. And it's something that we, we probably we would probably not have been able to do by ourselves. Yeah. Thank you, Tech Place. Yes. And of course, we didn't just build a rocket. Uh, we also built the launch system. So here are some photos of that. There was a ton of welding to be done, uh, particularly on that joint that the whole launch rail would pivot around. Um, and then something that a lot of folks don't often think about is paint. Painting a rocket is a whole thing, uh, as well as decals. It's it's a it's a art and science specific to rocketry, right? Yeah. And then here we have, um, is, this, is this Adam? I think it's Adam, right? Yes, Adam. <laughs> yeah, Adam, uh, who did a great job uh, painting. He works for another company there in Tech Place, but he was willing to help us out on the side as well as, uh, um, what, uh, what's the name of, the, Luke, what's the name of the gentleman who helped us, who, it continues, uh, Russ, right? He helps us out with uh, Russ Crandall with the welding on, on many occasions when you guys are too busy to, when our own team is too busy to do welding. Um, also helped us out again from a, another company based out of Tech Place. So it's been a real um, wealth of, of a talent um, and sharing between companies here at the Brunswick Landing. It's been uh, it's been excellent. Absolutely. And uh, here's here's Luke doing kind of like an informational photo, uh, not an inf inspirational photo shoot for like a poster or something. Um, that was that was our um, drug shoot, I believe, right? Yeah. Yes. That's those are made by Fruity Shoots, just to give them credit, credit is due. And this is the, the rig of Stardust. Uh, so this is just the lower section, the, the Marvel, the engine. Um, and it's, it's mechanically fastened to the launch rail in preparation for a static fire test. I like, I like saying it looked kind of like C-3PO from the prequels. <laughs> But those were those are some amazing tests. Yeah, they were also live streamed. Yeah, pretty cool. Yeah. All right, so here's the team up in Limestone here. In front of the hotshot hangar. Um, there's Brooke running and walking my way. And Luke there, hello, doing some last minute um, tweaks and changes and preparations for, for launch. Mm -hmm. the next day. Sasha, I remember driving behind you as you were uh, towing this trailer up the highway. And I remember thinking, I've, I'm used to, I grew up around, you know, well, not around, but watching launch pads that moved at maybe three miles an hour when there wasn't a rocket on them. And this, this launch pad was doing about 80. Or less, you know, whatever the speed limit was, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah, allegedly. Um, but I, I was thinking, man, this is this is new space. This is this is not a crawler that you could outwalk. This is new space, man. The tower was what six seventy feet, just about. It yep. Was yeah. A radio tower that two sections were permanent, so twenty feet were permanent, and then you'd place the other four or however many sections on top, and it was all guide in place with spreaders and and steel cable that's some pretty insane uh high tension just to keep things straight because when you got a tower that long and it's horizontal while you're loading it and you got to tilt it all up from the bottom it's like taking a broom holding it by the end of the handle and trying to bring it up vertical and uh so there's a lot of forces so the trailer itself was a <laughs> a task and it's yeah and you guys, you guys did a lot of engineering around uh, kind of analyzing what, what needed to be where and the strains of the cables and uh, the torque that needed to be there and all that stuff, right? Oh, man. Oh. We've got and we didn't have a dog designer. Right? Somebody agrees, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, man. All right. Uh, oh, this, is, this was a, an exciting moment, Sasha. Tell us about this. Oh, that is actually literally a, a photograph uh, of 
uh, when later I got in my truck to head out to the launch site area. And it is, you know, minus 12 Fahrenheit, which is actually not, you know, it gets a whole lot colder than that up there. And I was complaining about minus, tw- minus 12, minus 14, but it felt cold. It felt very cold. I, I remember one time up there, I tried to turn on the car radio and it just said, like, I'm sorry, I can't right now. <laughs> <laughs> we had minus 32. Wow. Last weekend. Yeah. No, that's, yeah. yeah. See, it's a good thing we did it last year. It was warmer. Absolutely. Absolutely. But here's the bright side, though. That's a sales pitch for what our rocket can do. That's that's, that's the temperatures that we can launch in because yep. um, the rocket was was totally fine. I mean, but once we deal, dealt with the valve, um, yep. which is very easy to deal with for down the road, yep. that rocket was perfectly happy at those temperatures. Yep. Uh, OK, uh, this, this is one of those absolutely stunning sunsets up there and uh, the team working on integration with the rocket and the, and the tower. And uh, Luke, this, this, uh, I noticed you're wearing a, a climbing harness in this, in this image. Uh, can you tell us a little about that? Oh, sure. I mean, you know, got to be tied in climbing around on this thing. It was, we'd have to go to the top of the tower routinely to, there's a weather station up there and uh, all sorts of bits and pieces. And um, so, yeah, just need to be safe. And um, I do sort of rock climbing and uh, stuff like that as a, as a hobby. And uh, so um, probably, uh, you know, an untypical climbing harness, but I had all the equipment to keep myself safe. So um, I was always clipped in and, and was the guy going up and down the tower, um, which was always quite, uh, quite chilly to be. 60, 70 feet up in the air in the middle of a runway at oh, night. I did it, man. <laughs> <laughs> I did it. Well, thank you yeah. for doing it. Thanks for getting that launch rail camera so perfectly situated as we're about to see in a couple of minutes here. Well, that's right. I forgot there were cameras up there too, yeah. Yeah, and, and thank you for everything else too, but the, the cameras, you know, near and dear to my heart. Oh, so this is, this is a beautiful video of after the first launch attempt, we had to scrub uh, because there just was not good weather. And uh, so here, here we are driving the, uh, the rocket back in the dark. We, we came back. Off the uh, runway. Yeah. Yep. This, is not, this is not on the runway. Yeah. Not on the road, just on the runway. Yes. But yeah, on the runway. Yep. That, was, that was interesting driving on that runway because your speedometer said, you know, 40, 45, and you look out and, and nothing's changing because it's, it's, the scale is so vast. Yeah. 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 It's amazing to think that you're, you're, you're driving where B-52s regularly took off and landed from. It's amazing. And this is where the F-15 would park. The hot shots. Yeah. Yeah. And that's also where our, we were parked. <laughs> And here is here is the moment. This is the best video we have of the Stardust flight. Courtesy of Mac Factory. Almost no trail, you know? It's amazing. Well, that time dialing in the fuel oxidizer ratios really paid off. Yep. Yep. Very clean. Here goes that crumble zone. Yep. There. <laughs> Boom. There you go. And you can Whoop. see how much it slows down. And we were going to launch again. Uh, we, we were fully planning to do a Stardust 2.0 launch at the end of the summer, um, you know, six months later. We decided to, to forego those efforts um, to focus all of, our efforts, all of our efforts on Starless Rogue. But we believe that, you know, save maybe a little bit of, you know, uh, superficial damage to the skin, it, it was ready to launch again. Uh, there wasn't much to change out. The crumple zone just had to be replaced. And 
a little bit of touch up and we were ready to launch again quickly. So it was yeah. really, um, and I'm confident we could have done it again. So, and we will do it again here in several months from now, if all goes well. You know, I do want to also put a shout out to our, um, our organic antenna tracker. <laughs> yes. <laughs> An intern, Ben the Mew, who's, uh, who's been through this a couple of times, been an intern with us from the University of Maine several times. He was on the back of my pickup truck uh, with an array of antennas um, for data and for video acquisition during the flight. And he was able to maintain one of the few videos that, um, that uh, I'm not sure if this one's showing, but one of the few videos that we were able to have in, while in flight um, before we were able to recover the rocket and download the video's feeds. Yeah, um, that, was, that was a tough job. Um, and ben, ben was so helpful that whole time. Um, just kind of odd jobs guy running around, whatever was needed, whatever needed doing, he did it. Uh, it was just amazing. So we are getting mighty close to the launch, to the premiere of the official trailer of Starless Road. So we've got a, uh, a link here, which I'm going to pop into the chat. And uh, so this is a, a YouTube link. Um, so in a couple minutes, we're going to wrap up this webinar. We're all gonna go over to YouTube to watch the full length official trailer of Starless Road. Have, uh, have fun reading the video description if you're so inclined. Uh, that was a lot of fun to write. Um, and uh, we'll still be around in the chat so we can still have you know, our, our, our witty banter. Um, but this, uh, well, I'm, I'm really excited for this session. I think, I think Knack Factory did some absolutely amazing work here. Yeah, stay tuned, just a few minutes from now. I just wanna thank once again, uh, Pedro Vasquez, our Blue Ship brand ambassador, Andrew Nia from our, the science teacher from Falmouth High School, Tim McCabe from the famous Loring Industries, um, Cuppy who can join us right today, but she is the secretary of Loring Air Force uh, Museum and a U United States Air Force veteran. Uh, and of course, uh, our very own Luke Sandin, uh, the senior mechanical engineer here at Blue Shift. Thank you all for commenting and taking the time to share this experience with everybody in the public. Um, we're hoping to do this again, perhaps in a little warmer conditions this time around. We'll see, see what we can do. <laughs> so stay tuned for this premiere. Thank you all very much.